Hugland. And I'm Alex Hogland. And this is our 1973 Triumph Stag. Welcome to Every Day to Exotic. Of all the things I've ever seen, your magic that I never thought I'd find. And there's no in between. You and me will run until the end of time. This is our 1973 Triumph Stag, perhaps one of the best, worst cars in history. In our opinion, more than any other vehicle, the Triumph Stag showcases the glowing ambitions and utter failures of British Leyland, which was the parent of nearly every British automotive brand after mergers in the late 1960s. Triumph began as an importer of bicycles in the 1880s, branching into cars in 1923. After World War II, the remains of the company were acquired by the Standard Motor Company, then invested heavily in selling Triumph badged sports cars to the United States, the TR2 and TR3 being their most successful early exports. Production through the 1960s largely consisted of entry-level sports cars, competing with MG domestically and primarily Fiat and Alfa Romeo overseas. Triumph introduced the Stag in 1970 in an attempt to bring the brand upscale with a luxury sports car and to compete directly with cars like the Mercedes-Benz 280SL we have featured previously. In the process, they launched their first and last in-house designed V8 engine. The result was a grand touring car with sleek lines designed by Giovanni Micolotti with creature comforts not generally found in Triumph cars like air conditioning, power steering, and power brakes. It also had an amazing exhaust note from its 3.0-liter V8. Unfortunately, it also premiered at a time of great turmoil in the British car industry, rife with mismanagement, labor strikes, government interference, and excessive internal competition. All of this came together with several flaws in the engine design leading to the Stag having a reputation of being incredibly unreliable, getting the car pulled from the US market in 1974, despite some improvements to try and address the inherent flaws in the car. Only 2,871 Triumph Stags were exported to the United States, and over its production life, 25,877 were built total. The vast majority remained in Britain, where production soldiered on for another four years, ceasing in 1977. Despite all its inherent problems, this well-sorted example is a great car to drive, and shows that if it had come at a time when there was less strife and chaos in the British car industry, they could have had an absolute winner. So the design of the Triumph Stag originally started as a design that Giovanni Michelotti had done for the Triumph 2000, which was a four-door saloon. It has much the same general lines as far as the shape, the front and the back, but instead of having a fixed roof, this has a nice removable hardtop and a convertible top that goes with it. This car is not its original color. The original color was sapphire blue. But the person who owned the car before us went, this is insufficiently sapphire. It was dark and it was flat. And so they chose a Mercedes color called Bahama Blue. It's sparkly, but it looks a lot more like a sapphire than the original sapphire did. One of the many things I love about this color is how it sets off the chrome. And the chrome is a super important part of the design of this car. Once again, it's a lot like jewelry. It's like the entire car is a gemstone, and the chrome is the setting. One of the other things that's very interesting about this car is how little Triumph branding is on it. It is all about the stag. 
in that way, it's a little bit like a Ford Mustang in that a Ford Mustang has very little Ford, but that horse is everywhere. One other interesting thing about the Stag is that the term Stag originally came from the project name for this car. Triumph historically would use four letter designations for their projects, like Bomb is what they used for the Spitfire, for example. And the Stag, this was Stag, was their project name. And it's the only one that's ever actually carried forward into the actual production name of the car. The emblem is also a little bit odd because the antlers on the Stag go completely the wrong direction. Although that makes it look like it's going much faster than it actually should. <laughs> I never noticed that. I never noticed that either. They point back. They yeah. shouldn't As point back. As opposed to pointing out. They should point forward. <laughs> there are a lot of elements in the design of this car that are carried over all the way from the front to the back. So we can start looking at the front grille here and you see the surround here with the four headlights. You have the hood, which is fairly flat, but then has these inverted sort of power bulge that runs all the way down. It runs down the hood, along over the roof into the back. The point here of the light also continues all the way down the side of the car as you move towards the back and then joins up at the very back into the chrome trim around the back, which when we look at it closely, it echoes the chrome trim from the front. And so we have very much the same shape front to back on this car. And so it basically completes the line so that the, you have a very long, straight, flowing design to the entire car. This car design is starting to get into some of the more aerodynamic lines that became very, very popular in the 1970s. One example of this is how the door handles are inset. There's nothing out there causing wind resistance. The door handles are also very interesting because they open up it also takes some strength to do that. The previous owners said that was one of the best security features of the car. Sound of quality, good solid doors. Another example of this is the chrome inset locking gas cap is curved so that it fits flush to the side of the car. And this reduces wind resistance. It also has a lock so that uh, nobody's gonna siphon off your fuel. One of the things I particularly like about this car, and which was really done primarily to compete with the Mercedes SLs, was they wanted this car to be a car you could use every day. And for that, they put a really nice factory steel roof on it. This is a roof that comes off, it's fairly easy to remove, gives you very much the feel that you're in a fully enclosed, permanent roofed car when it's mounted on. And just like if this were a coupe, the rear window actually pops open, so I can reach back, open it up, push the glass out, and let air flow through. You've got a heated rear window and you can actually see the wires in here. And that works even though you can take the roof on and off. You don't have to plug things in and unplug them. It connects automatically as the roof comes on and off. It seals very well to the body. It fits very well to the body. A lot of people when they see this car for the first time, like a lot of people when they first see a Mercedes SL, don't realize that that roof actually comes off. It really looks like it belongs there. Here's one of the few other places that the car is badged and you'll notice that it's stag or as Jeremy Clarkson would say, stag. Stag. One nice thing about this being a 1973 Mark II model of the stag is we actually got the alloy wheels. Most of the first Triumph stags that came in the United States came in with wire wheels as standard. 72 spoke wires that were, I believe, actually unique to the stag for that version. So the majority of cars in Britain actually were steel wheels as opposed to necessarily even alloys. Not as pretty, not as nice, but at least in the US we got the alloys. So here we are at the back. As Alex mentioned, it does echo the front. It frames the tail lights. And the tail lights are once again sort of combined. You have your brake lights and your turn signals and everything all set in this beautiful slender chrome strip that echoes the shape of the overall rear. This is the only place on the car where it says Triumph. Everywhere else there's branding, it says Stag. One of the details I particularly like about this design is how much the back is actually inset. 
And that is something that's kind of unique to these cars. It's something that you see in other Triumphs kind of copying the style. You see it in, for example, the last version of the Triumph GT6 and the Spitfire. It just really is something unusual in the shape of the car. It's not quite a cam tail, it's a little bit more deep than anything along that line. It's just a really sort of unique, pretty feature. So the trunk actually opens pretty easily with just a push button. The trunk is fairly spacious. This is a really good road trip car, in my opinion. You can fit a couple of like roller board size suitcases in there, backpacks, that kind of thing. However, there's one downside to this trunk, which although it looks like you can put a box of wine in here, due to these ribs on the trunk lid, you can't quite close it. You could technically put it on side, but that would be less secure for the wine. So not so recommended. So unfortunately, this is another zero boxes of wine car, at least in the trunk. But that's what the back seat's for. So now we're about to talk about the interior, but first we need to take the top off. To do that, open both doors. There are two latches in the front and two latches in the back. And just lifts off. And then just off into the distance. Now that we have the roof off, you'll see some significant differences between this and a convertible like our Mercedes 280SL. So not only do we have the window frames that are still here, we have this roll bar assembly here that actually ties into the front windscreen. That's actually here for a couple different reasons. They basically took what was a four-door sedan and they cut the roof off to build the car. It wasn't really that sturdy a structure without the roof. It was much easier in order to put a structure along this line and put kind of roll bar in. The other thing that was going on in the late 60s, early 1970s, is there was a huge fear that after Ralph Nader published Unsafe at Any Speed, that they were going to ban convertibles in the United States. This was a solution that allowed them not only to strengthen the car, but also gave them a roll hoop that then allowed this car to potentially continue to be sold should that ban have gone into place. Now we have the hardtop off. The thing is, you can't take the hardtop with you. And we live in Oregon, where it could rain at any time. Luckily, there's a convertible top. So in order to open the soft top, I have a lever inside that I need to pull that releases this cover. Once it's released, it lifts up, and then the top just lifts out. Once we have the front in place, we just fold this down. There are a couple little catches here we need to flip to let it come free. Then this goes down, we attach the front, and then clip the back into place. And then your soft top's up. Voila! Great, welcome to the interior. This is the original color, but not the original interior, the luxurious Vinyl. Vinyl was super popular in the 1970s uh, because it was considered cheaper and easier to maintain than leather. The color on this is called Shadow Blue, which I think is pretty cool. The interesting thing about this dashboard and the central console is that it's wood. This is the only place where wood is, as far as I know, in the car. Wood meant luxury. And again, they were trying to build an upscale vehicle. We have some other interesting uh, branding in here. We have Triumph on the floor mats. And door sill, also say Triumph, but those aren't visible when the doors are closed. We have Stag in the middle of the steering wheel. And then we have British Leyland on the pedals. That's kind of unusual. This car has power steering, which means that the steering wheel doesn't have to be huge, which I really like as a short person. Let's me see over it a little bit better. The other thing about the steering wheel is that it is padded for safety. This is the 1970s, which means that your horn is not here where you would instinctively want it to be. Instead, it's over here on this little stock. It's a very satisfying horn at least. 
But uh, I have to say, in a panic situation, I don't generally think, ah, you know, a little awkward, but supposedly safer. Speaking of safety, on the dash, we have all of these lovely gauges. They're all fairly well labeled for the most part. This is your wheel of safety. All of your alert lights are on here. You know, your high beams are on, your turn signal's on, your handbrake is on, your choke is on, your hazards are on. <laughs> Many things are labeled very nicely with either text or symbols we understand. However, that, that is the choke. That's what that is. What is that symbol? I don't know. Here's our shift knob. This came with overdrive from the factory. It's a little switch right here, which gives us a fifth gear. It's not complicated. I love that. This is the original factory radio, AM and FM. The other thing that I love about it is it's also got the British Leyland symbol on it. Definitely marks that as original. Another luxury thing, power windows. Also very cool, those are in here. So along with the power windows, you also have this little knob. And if you turn it, then your little side vent opens up. So if you don't wanna just roll down the window, you also have that option. So it looks like there's two door handles to let you out. Actually, the top one will let you out. The bottom one will lock the door. So you have a locking glove box for security. We also have this cool little shelf under here. That's where the knitting goes. And then we also have this map pocket with this cute little ruffle on it. This car came with seat belts in both the front and rear seats. That's another wonderful 1970s innovation. Speaking of the rear seat, it is fully functional. We have had fully grown adults with legs in the back seat for a fairly long drive and they didn't complain, so. Now we're gonna move on to the engine bay, the part of this car where all the troubles began. So this is actually the first V8 engine that Triumph designed themselves. And the intention was to build a modular engine design that could be used in various different cars in different configurations. However, there were a bunch of design issues that came in that really made this engine compromise from the very beginning. The biggest one is the water pump. The water pump is very high on the block, just right at the very top, kind of in the V of the valley. And the problem with that is if you lose any coolant, the water level can easily drop below where the water pump is, at which point you're no longer circulating coolant through the engine. When that happened, it would cause the heads on these engines to warp. There was not really a good way to prevent that from happening with the way the heads were designed. They were held on by studs along one side and by bolts on the other side at two different angles. What that means is that you've got weird stresses on the heads that makes it very difficult to get torqued down properly. When the engine would overheat, it would cause the heads to warp because they aren't torqued down evenly. And when the heads warp, you can't really machine them to get them flat again because there just isn't enough material on the heads. The other issue was they had to get this car to pass emissions in California. And unfortunately, emissions in California meant that they tended to run them very lean, which generates more heat, which causes it to overheat. And so these cars developed a nasty reputation for overheating in most conditions, and that completely destroyed Triumph's reputation for this car in the United States. Some of those issues got addressed on the Mark II, like this car, but a lot of them ended up really not getting fixed properly until the aftermarket kind of came in and figured out ways to make the cars much more reliable. One one of the solutions for fixing the heads is to torque them down multiple times over the first couple thousand miles that you drive the car after the engine gets built. Unfortunately, in order to compete with the Mercedes, Triumph in marketing decided, oh, we should really have the same service interval as the Mercedes, which has your first oil change at 7,500 miles. The problem is these cars usually wouldn't make it 7,500 miles before they would overheat. And if you aren't torquing the heads down repeatedly over the course of it warming up, breaking in, you basically don't get even pressure on that head gasket and it tends to warp and blow the head gaskets, especially when it overheats. 
Fortunately, this car has had a complete rebuild of the engine. It is still the original engine, but it has a lot of updates and things that have been done and make it much more reliable. I'm still a little bit paranoid about driving this on a really hot day. I really don't want to get stuck to the point where I have to try and rebuild this thing. Other things you'll see in here as far as the engine bay, you've got your two carburetors here and they're connected with a join throttle system, which is right here, basically linking the two together. And so that all comes into the center manifold that then goes out to each side of the engine. We've got power brakes off of a booster here with a nice big reservoir. It is dual circuit, so front and rear are two separate circuits. So you've got some reliability and safety there. The airbox here and the valve covers are chrome on this car. They originally would have not been. They would have been a hammer painted surface, something similar to this. Originally they weren't. The previous owner really just wanted to add a little bit of bling and he was re-chroming other parts of the car, so we tossed these in the batch. One other entertaining design decision was the location of the battery, which is tucked way down here, right in this corner, up by the front grille and next to the radiator. Right in front of the battery is your power steering pump. You cannot physically get the battery out of the car with a powering steering pump in place. So another great thing that you have to do whenever you want to change your battery is pull the powering steering pump off, pull the battery out, just really a poor choice of locations and poor fit. It probably would have been better if they thought about putting the battery in the trunk like they did on some MGs. The suspension is almost exactly the same suspension as what they used in the Triumph TR6. It has double wishbones up front with a standard shock absorber, a tube shock in the back, it has semi-trailing arms, so independent suspension in the back. So the center differential connects the wheels through drive shafts that have flex joints in them and a sliding joint in order to allow them to adjust for the length as it moves. That creates a little bit of weirdness driving sometimes. If you're accelerating under load in a corner, that um, sliding joint can somewhat bind and it causes some little bit of like weird hop as you drive. But overall, it works pretty well and it was a good solution for the time. So there's a lot of factors that kind of came into the failure of this. Some of it's mechanical, some of it was poor quality of materials as far as the timing chain. Some of it was marketing, trying to compete with a car that frankly was better built than this was. There were a lot of factors that were kind of coming together that basically made what really should have been an incredibly good car with a great engine into probably one of the greatest misses of its time. Unfortunately, the vast majority of them really were failures. It made these cars kind of a lemon when they were new. Once they're sorted like this one is, you really realize how great of a car it could have been. Right, now that we've gone through that, let's go for a drive. Woohoo! Am I allowed to say woohoo? Yes. Okay. start by saying I love this car. <laughs> this car is so easy to drive. It's so responsive. It is the perfect car for what we're doing today, which is cruising down the road on an absolutely stunning Oregon morning. This road is fabulous. You know how sometimes you have the right car on the right road? So I had driven this car before, but it's been a couple of years uh, since I was in the driving seat. And it's funny because I would say even a couple of years ago, I was a much less confident driver. I think even in a car this easy to drive, I was definitely more nervous two years ago. And now it just feels like, oh no, no this is, you know, easy peasy routine. I can enjoy it more now. And this is definitely an enjoyable car. It's very stable, it's very comfortable. The suspension's very good. It just does everything I ask, everything I want it to do. In fact, sometimes it's a little too responsive uh, with the steering. 
it's just something that you get used to. And I just love how it takes turns. I don't have to do a lot of braking into turns. I mean, enough to be safe, but you don't feel like, ooh, I better slow way down. It accelerates nicely. It feels more relaxed than the Mercedes Twin ESL. I agree. No, I agree. I mean, the SL is a nice car to drive, but I constantly feel that even going 55, like we are now, that you need another gear. Yes, the speed limit is 55 out here, but I'm mostly hovering around 50. I don't have anyone behind me really, other than the <laughs> other than our van. It's you can be a little bit leisurely in this thing if you want to, but it will go if you really need it to go. I mean, at the same point, you're driving a V8, but it's got a 6,500 RPM redline, so it's actually perfectly happy going at high revs as well. Yeah. Most of the time, you don't really need to. I mean, we're cruising at 50, 50, 55, and it's turning 2,500 right now without the overdrive turned on. Yes. But it's not the kind of V8 that you're like sitting in your house and you hear somebody rev their engine outside and it just feels like, yes, yes, you have an engine. We know. Yeah. It's quietly confident. It's one of the things I actually really love about classic cars. They all have personality. They're all a little different. And so part of driving so many different cars is getting to know each car as an individual. <laughs> This one, for some reason, though, does make me want to go fast. Let me show you how it's going. I love the acceleration of this car. Once you get going, it's like you hit about 3,000 RPM, and then it really starts taking off. 5,000 RPM. <laughs> So taking the overdrive is quite simple. I just flip a switch on the shift knob here, and then we're up to 60 here. Ooh, solar farm? Yep, that is King Estate Winery. Ah, yes. Largest single contiguous winery in Oregon. I mean, it really is a fun car to drive. It handles corners beautifully. It just kind of eases through them just wonderfully. Here we've got some sort of banked sweeping turns. There are a bunch of sort of landslides in this part of the road. So when they rebuilt it, they rebuilt it in just these beautiful little S curves. Makes it an absolute joy to drive. Part of why I know I love this car and I think it will score high for me on delight is I didn't want to get out of the driver's seat. I was having so much fun. The one complaint I have about this car is the steering. It's responsive. That's the problem. It's actually too responsive. The Brits weren't developing much of their own power steering equipment when they decided to start putting star power steering in cars. They bought it from the Americans. And the power steering systems that we had in the US were largely based off the fact that you're turning a 3,000 to 4,000 pound car at least around every corner. These big, heavy, lumbering cars with horrible handling and you needed the power steering because you had a giant heavy V8 in front. Yeah, this car is a V8, but it's only three liter V8. It's not large. And so when we talk about power steering, it feels really boosted because- yeah, it's, over, it's definitely over boosted. I mean, this really isn't a sports car. It's a luxury touring car. Compared to modern luxury cars, it probably isn't as luxury, but at least from the time period that it came out, it really had a lot of the advantages of a higher end car. I mean, power steering was a luxury. Air conditioning was a luxury. Can you even buy a car without air conditioning now? Not easily. It's bits of road like this that I particularly love. Oh yeah. But just these like beautifully dappled, tree-lined, green, canopied areas are just stunning to drive through. 
with the especially with the, the lovely curves on the road and it's just these are the driving experiences that are part of the uh, joy of living in Oregon. It's kind of unfair, the confluence, is that the right word? Yeah, confluence of confluence all of the- Confluence of circumstances that sort of just came together to curse this car because you can, you can see and you can feel the potential. Yeah, it really could have been great. It really could have been one of the best cars that Britain had ever made at that point in time. Well, that was incredibly fun. And now we're back in the studio to do the Halpin score. Here's how it works. Alex and I have individually rated the car in five categories, each with a rank of zero to 10. Then we add our scores together to give us the final Halpin score. After we combine our scores, the results go up on the board. So our first category is performance. On this car, I gave it a seven. It's actually a pretty nice performing car. That V8 has a great sound. It gives good acceleration. It handles well. It's comfortable. It's not necessarily the fastest, but at the same point, it's definitely fast enough to be enjoyable. And I gave it a seven for very similar reasons. It will do everything you ask. It's very easy to drive. And if you want to go faster, it'll let you go faster. But if you just want to enjoy the curves, it'll do that too. For style, I gave this car an eight. I love everything about it. I love the lines, I love the color, the blue interior. It's unusual, it coordinates well with the exterior. It's just a gorgeous car. I gave it a six. This car with the hard top on is freaking gorgeous. The problem for me is when you take the hard top off. When you roll down the windows with the top off, you still have the window frames that are always sticking up. You have that T-bar, which I understand structurally why it's there, but at the same time, it really is sort of detrimental. It makes it feel like a half-hearted convertible. For drivability, I gave the car an eight. You really could probably drive this car pretty much every day in kind of all kinds of conditions. The only downsides I'd really say are the reliability concerns. Although this one has been very reliable in our ownership, it has a reputation for having problems. And when problems happen, they tend to go very bad. So that really, to some extent, hurts my ability to drive it every day. And I gave it a nine. I liked the size of the trunk, but I guess if you're buying like Costco items, it would fill up pretty quickly. I love that it has four seats that are functional, so you can take friends. I could use this as an everyday car very easily. So for significance, I gave this an eight. It is significant for both good and bad reasons. It's a symbol of everything that went wrong with the British car industry, but at the same time, it is a wonderful addition to our collection. I feel like ours is significant for being one of the good ones, if that makes sense. Entertainingly enough, for very much the same reasons, I gave it a four. <laughs> really? <laughs> so it was not a success for Triumph. It's not what they really hoped it would be. It's significant in its failure more than it's significant in its success. And for me, it's a great car for the collection because, partly because of the history of that and the fact that it is a beautiful, unique car. They did not sell that many in the United States because it was such a failure. <laughs> Finally, Delight. Delight is actually where I think this car really shines in a lot of ways. It's a beautiful car. Most people look at it and go, what the heck is it? The V8 is one of the best sounding V8 engines ever made in a lot of ways. So I ended up giving this car an eight for Delight. And I gave it a seven. I loved driving this car. I could happily drive this car every day, all the time. People did react extremely positively to it. However, I don't feel like it elicits the same delight and positive reactions that some of our other cars do. Absolutely. All right, after doing some math, the score is 72 points for our 1973 Triumph Stag. That puts it in seventh place, one point behind the Mercedes 280 SL, which was its main target competitor. 
Personally, I actually ranked it a little bit higher than the Mercedes. You ranked it evidently a little bit lower. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of sort of where it fits. In a lot of ways, it didn't entirely miss the mark. And if they'd sorted out some of the minor issues, it would have absolutely dominated, at least from our point of view. I also feel like I should say that if we had done the Stag first, I probably would have scored the Mercedes lower because I would have had this to compare the Mercedes to. And I liked this one more. I think the Mercedes is a, in some ways, more elegant car, but at the same time, this is actually a better driver. Assuming that you don't overheat or break down or have bits fall off or any of the problems that these had when they were new. Yeah. <laughs> so now we have passed the magical 1,000 subscriber mark and we've finished off our first season of programs. That's 10 fantastic episodes of great cars. We really appreciate your comments. We've had a lot of good interactions with folks already, and we're looking forward to a lot more. The Stag here is just the start of another amazing season. We've got a lot of fantastic cars lined up. So this is an opportunity for us to start pulling in some really unusual stuff as well. And thank you for your support, for the encouragement to continue to do this. We're absolutely gonna keep doing it and have a hell of a lot of fun on the way. Can we say how? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I think that's a great place to cut it. <laughs> Can we say hell? Yes. Okay. <laughs> the end. <laughs>